The first thing I want to say really is a big thank you to the HDA for inviting me along to talk today and for the opportunity to speak to this community, which is always such a pleasure. It's such um, important work that we're doing together and it's always good to be able to come and talk about some of the things that we're doing. I'm here today specifically to talk about psychological strategies and living well with Huntington's. And when I talk about people who are living with Huntington's, I'm not just thinking about people who carry the gene expansion. I'm also thinking about people within HD affected families. I think HD impacts across the whole family, which has come up over and over again already today. So I'm here to speak to everybody who is living in those situations and hopefully give you some ideas for how to look after yourselves, maybe a little better than you have so far, or to get some new ideas for things to try. In the next 45 minutes-ish, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Huntington's affects mental well-being, and we've already had a really brilliant talk on that today. So fortunately, that's not a big part of what I was planning to speak to you about. What I do want to do after that is spend the bulk of this talk on some of the practical things you can do to look after yourselves in terms of your mental well-being, starting to think about how you focus on what matters most to you and what gives you um, value and meaning in life. And then I'll spend a few minutes at the end talking about some of the work I've been doing with the HDA on moving forward with psychological support for people affected by Huntington's. I always feel I should give you a little bit of background. Um, unlike a lot of our brilliant speakers today, I might not be so familiar to you as some of the others. So I'm a clinical psychologist and a psychology researcher in Huntington's disease. I do do other research in neurodegenerative conditions, dementia and um, acquired brain injury, but Huntington's is the place where my heart is. It's what I'm most passionate about. And it's partly why I'm so pleased to be here today because this really, really matters to me. I've been working with people affected by Huntington's in various contexts for, uh, gosh, about 10 years now, starting as an assistant psychologist way, way back in the day, working in research contexts and more recently as a qualified clinical psychologist. I collaborate with people all over the world in the research that I do, which is just a wonderful opportunity for all of us to pull together worldwide on some of the issues that are most important to supporting people affected by HD. But the thing that we all have in common in different, um, different societies, different communities, we all have this priority around improving psychological well-being for people who are affected by Huntington's. And it gives us loads of opportunities to draw on different resources, different ideas, and we just have this big network that are really focused on working towards these, um, these important changes for the community. In my day job, um, as well as being a lecturer for the University of Leicester, I work as a clinical psychologist in my local NHS trust, um, mostly with people with um, either long-term health conditions or specifically neurological difficulties. So all of this, I guess, is kind of what brings me here today to talk to you. I want to start by thinking a little bit about some of the difficulties that are linked to having Huntington's, and I'll dwell on these to a greater or lesser extent as appropriate. I'm going to start with motor difficulties, but that's where I'm going to spend the least of my time talking to you, because as a psychologist, these are the bits that are the least in my wheelhouse, I guess. But they're also really important, because I guess when we think about Huntington's, we're often thinking about the visible physical changes, and certainly that's how we have traditionally thought of them, although there's been a big shift in, in recent years to thinking about psychological, psychiatric, um, and emotional impacts. So we know that motor difficulties start to come on um, generally kind of adulthood, middle age. It can vary an awful lot, as we all know. And in the case of, for example, JHD, it's a lot, lot sooner. Some of these difficulties look like that really typical career, those involuntary movements. There might also be slowing of movements. There might be muscle rigidity. And some of this feeds into the diagnostic process. Now, as a psychologist, the place where this becomes relevant to me and in terms of thinking about psychological well-being is the effect that this stuff has on somebody's independence and their ability to care for themselves. If you're somebody who traditionally thinks of yourself as very independent, you like to do everything for yourself, and then that becomes more problematic for you because you're not physically able, that can have a really big impact on your emotional well-being. And by extension and kind of ripple effect, it can also affect the people around you who might need to work with you differently to make sure that you can do the things that you're passionate about and you care about. I'm going to move on from motor difficulties. As I said, I'm just touching on that very briefly because I want to talk a bit more about cognition. This one, I think, is not something that people are as familiar with or might not have been in the past. So we know at this point that cognitive changes start at least 15 years before these physical changes start to kick in on average. Maybe they start even sooner than that. We don't know yet. But what we know is that these changes start to impact on people before they ever have a, a diagnosis of manifest Huntington's. And during those years before, you can start to see some sort of subtle, some not so subtle changes in the way that people process information. And when we talk about cognition, we mean the way that people think, the patterns in how they think, and sometimes those can be helpful or less helpful. So we know that people might start to get 
a little bit slower in how they process information. They might find it harder to process big chunks of information. I had a supervisor once who described it as a bit like a, a funnel, like you might use to put oil into your car. And they said it in somebody before they develop Huntington's or in somebody who doesn't have a neurological diagnosis, you might have quite a nice broad funnel. So lots of room for information to, to come in and pass through. But then as you maybe start to develop Huntington's disease, that funnel narrows a little bit and it maybe takes a bit more time for information to pass through and you need to feed it through in little bits and pieces so that person can manage that information okay. And I'm sure that's going to be familiar to a lot of people here. We also talk about this thing called executive function and there's a lot of nasty kind of academic looking words there which I'm going to talk through as we go. So executive function is talking about the higher level stuff that we all do, probably a lot of us here do without thinking about it every day. One of the things that's really important that changes in the way that people with HD may or may not think is um, in terms of their insight into their difficulties or their symptoms. And I know from talking to loads of people in the HD community over the years that it's not all that uncommon for people with Huntington's to not necessarily fully recognize or maybe not recognize at all the kind of difficulties that they might be encountering, whether that's physical or in terms of their mood or their behavior. And that can be really tough for them. It can be really tough for the people around them. We also start to see as um, HD progresses, we start to see changes in people's ability to inhibit their behavior. And when I talk about that, it's this idea that um, we all think things during the day. Probably we all do, I certainly do. We have thoughts or we are inclined to do things that actually aren't a really good idea. So it might be things that are socially inappropriate or things that might be hurtful to other people or that we just generally wouldn't want to say or do. And we're able to put those brakes on unless we're a person who has Huntington's, which is progressing. And at that point, putting those brakes on can become really, really tricky. And actually people might say things or do things that they never would have done before, which can be really upsetting for that person. And it can really impact on people around them again. So psychological well-being can really be impacted for the person with Huntington's, for the people around them by some of these cognitive changes. And as time goes on, I'm not going to touch on this too much, but we'll start to see differences in memory and somebody's orientation. So knowing who you are, where you are, who the people are around you, what day or date it is, things like that. As people go on, some of those things can become a bit more difficult to, um, to hang on to. I'm going to move on from cognition at this point, because I do want to spend most of today talking about the, um, the ways that we can support psychological well-being. But I do need to touch on behavior because that's one of the things that people consistently report is really tricky in terms of psychological well-being around HD in families affected by Huntington's. As I've mentioned, people can start to become a bit disinhibited. So those breaks are off. People might do things which put them at risk or which might get them into trouble or which might upset the people around them. People can also um, become, I've got aggressive here and it's in these sort of quote marks because as a psychologist, we always try to think about um, so-called aggressive behavior as trying to communicate a message. So if somebody is being, um, if somebody's like being aggressive, they're hitting out, they're snappy, they're not very happy for one reason or another. As somebody's already alluded to in, um, in one of the chat comments, this is often expressing something. So it might be pain or discomfort or unhappiness or embarrassment, but either way, people might start to show more of this kind of aggressive type behavior, whatever the reason might be. And again, that can be really tricky for people to manage. And sometimes some of that um, that unhappiness, that um, that aggression, it becomes it gets turned inwards as well. So people might even engage in in self harming type behavior, which can obviously be incredibly upsetting for the person with Huntington's and for the people who love them and want to support them. All right, so I've talked about physical difficulties, cognition, behavior. These are things that we kind of know are quite tied to the progression of Huntington's over time. We know that these things are likely to kind of get worse and follow a, a reasonably predictable pattern. Although the the cliche. It's true that um, if you've met one person with Huntington's, you've met one person with Huntington's. You can't predict what it's going to look like entirely. But there are expectations about what happens at which stage to some extent. Until we get to the emotional difficulties associated with HD, which is why I've got sort of on there. There are things that we know tend to be seen in people affected by Huntington's, um, as we've heard about already today. So it's not atypical to hear about um, people expressing low mood, um, might be referred to as depression. It's not a label that I tend to use as a clinical psychologist, but it's talking about similar difficulties. People express a lot of anxiety. People can become irritable, frustrated, angry. They might um, be in denial, which is sort of distinct from this lack of insight into symptoms because one is about a cognitive difficulty and one is about being frightened and really struggling to engage with thoughts about what's going on. And there's a lot of shock and grief around, and I'm sure that lots of people listening can um, can relate to a lot of these things and will have experienced lots of these things themselves. 
But what I want to think about is, I guess, how much of this is about the gene expansion and the impact of a uh, buildup of Huntington, and how much of it is around what's going on in the family environment or what we call the systemic context in a, a therapeutic um, in a therapeutic setting. We know that there is a link between Huntington's and some specific symptoms. I've already talked about physical, cognitive, behavioral difficulties. And we also know that some psychological symptoms are quite well tied into um, HD progression. So anxiety, for example, is a fairly predictable difficulty, and we expect to see it with people who are dealing with Huntington's. But we also know from the research that, uh, that my people are doing and that um, other teams in the HD space are doing is that people in HD families show quite similar profiles of mental distress, whether they're the person who carries the gene expansion or they're just somebody within that HD family who's coping with similar sorts of stresses. And that makes things a little bit trickier, doesn't it? Because it means that these, um, these difficulties are not just HD symptoms, but maybe there's also something about the environment and the difficulties that people find themselves coping with as an HD family. What we found in a recent study I did with some colleagues is that there were some quite common shared difficulties among people in HD affected families. So that's people who carry the gene expansion and the people who are around them who love that person and want to support them. And they're all pretty understandable, I think. I can imagine people sort of looking at these and, and thinking, yes, this makes sense. And it makes sense to me too. So we found that lots of people in HD families were feeling anxious. So people talk about feelings of, of dread, of worry, of panic, of not being able to relax. And when you think about the difficulties that people are dealing with as um, an HD affected family, whatever role you take within that, anxiety seems like a really reasonable response. You're worrying about the future. You might be worrying about people within the family. You might be worrying about how to cope. Anxiety seems like a really, really normal reaction to that. Low mood is also really common. And again, it seems like a fairly reasonable reaction to being in a really difficult situation. So people talk about not enjoying life, not finding things fun, not looking forward to the future. And all of those things seem, again, like really typical reactions, whether you're a person who has Huntington's or somebody who is in that HD family but doesn't carry the gene expansion. Finding things difficult doesn't seem like an unusual reaction to me. I think that's really understandable. And then we come to this irritability or anger, which, again, we know is something that people with the HD ex um, gene expansion may experience. So we have talked about that already today, but we were also finding this in the, the family members of people with HD, and that could take the form of what we call outward irritability. So things like slamming doors or snapping at people, sort of obvious irritation directed at objects or people. But then there's also this kind of inward irritability or anger where people might um, speak very unkindly to themselves, give themselves quite harsh words. They might even self-harm. But what I really want to emphasize is how these difficulties were through our HD families and not just tied to people carrying the gene expansion. And I am going somewhere with all of this. What I want to do first is think about why those things might be happening. And I bet there are a lot of people in this room today who could tell me this already. We know that people who are affected by Huntington's um, may experience changes in their roles and their responsibilities within work or within a family. I always think about my own dad when I'm talking about this. My dad is from a very rural um, Scottish family, so sort of very, very rural. You have to drive for probably 100 miles through nothing to get to where they all live. And as a result, he has some pretty traditional values in terms of what he feels is, um, is the man's role in a family. He was the breadwinner. He was the decision maker. He did all of those big, important jobs to keep the family running. And then he, um, he was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative condition. And that actually had a really huge impact on him in more than the obvious ways, because he was dealing with being unwell, he was dealing with the symptoms that came with it. But it also meant that those really important roles that were part of his personality got, um, got really disrupted. So he couldn't be the person who was earning all the money and looking after the family in that way anymore, because he couldn't keep doing the job that he was doing. And he couldn't make all the decisions because he wasn't able to process that information in the same way that he used to. So it had a massive impact on my dad and who he believed that he was and his sense of himself. But it also had a really big impact on my mum, who was from a similarly traditional family. And she thought of herself as parent to the kids. And she did the housework and she kept the house nice. And she did um, voluntary jobs around the community. And that was her sense of who she was while my dad brought the money home. And again, her role completely shifted as a result of my dad's diagnosis. She ended up um, having to be the person that brought money into the family. She ended up having to make all the decisions, which was never something that she'd expected to do. And she didn't really know how to cope with it at first. She did adapt over time. But these things have massive impacts. So when we're talking about these difficulties throughout HD families in terms of psychological well-being, it's because these sorts of difficulties 
impact on everybody. Obviously, with changes in roles and responsibilities and swapping of jobs, there are financial implications to that. For example, my mum not having worked for, gosh, 20 years, I think, before this happened, she, um, she wasn't able to go and get a job like the kind of job that my dad had. So there were changes in our financial situation, which again impacted throughout the whole family and caused difficulties that I guess we probably never thought were going to happen at first. We also know there's effects of HD across multiple generations. So there's trauma, there's grief, there's loss, the person who carries the gene expansion, the people around them, everybody is affected by this stuff. This is not specific to carrying the, um, the gene expansion specifically. We talk about people with Huntington's being less able to cope with social interactions at times. So it might feel more difficult to have conversations, to follow a conversation, to, um, to manage those kind of busy, difficult environments at times. So people with Huntington's might get a little bit avoidant of busy situations or things that they used to enjoy doing. But we also find that families who are coping with HD can feel very stressed, can be struggling, can feel drained. And maybe that makes this sort of social aspect of life feel really hard for them too. And there's also this thing about others not really understanding how you're feeling and not really understanding what you're dealing with. And their reactions can also be pretty unhelpful, especially if people can be kind of stigmatizing or have lots of difficult questions. So closing up on this bit of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, finishing up this bit about the impacts on families. We know that people in HD families, whether they carry the expanded gene or whether there's somebody in that family who doesn't, are likely to be experiencing some kind of psychological distress or difficulties. And the reasons for this are really complicated and they're really hard to change. Um, the people I, I see in therapy are probably sick to death of hearing me say there's no magic wand to fix this. I so wish that there was. But there's a real need for support. And it, just over and over again, I hear from people in the HD community saying we need psychological support. We definitely need it for people who have Huntington's, but we really need it for families too. So I'm going to start with some fairly... I want to say simple things that might help, little practical things that you can change in day-to-day -day life that might help to support your psychological well-being and give you a little bit of a lift. And a lot of these suggestions come from people who are affected in HD by HD one way or another. One of the biggest ones that comes through, and I know one that the HDA has particularly been pushing as a message in, um, in recent weeks, is talk to somebody. Don't try to cope on your own. You can talk to people that you might know through HD services. You might talk to people that you've met through groups, for example. You might speak to a specialist HD advisor. I'm just constantly impressed by how much the um, SHDAs know and how much support they're able to give. They're just wonderful people. And I can't say enough how important it is to go and talk to them if, if you need some support, even just on a practical level. Their knowledge is just boundless. So talk to somebody if you need HD support. That's your place to go. Sometimes you also just want to talk to someone who knows nothing about Huntington's and is not what you want to talk about because it can just feel as if that's what you've been thinking about constantly for quite a long time. So speaking to somebody that you know through work, through interests, going to online forums, finding somebody to have a chat to about something not HD related can also be just what you need from time to time. So talk to people is a really important takeaway, I think. We also know that gentle physical activity, so even a, a brief walk that it gives you a bit of a change of scenery and some fresh air, can be really beneficial for your well-being. We know that more physical and more heavy physical activity is also really positive in terms of releasing endorphins and all that good stuff. Not everybody always feels up to running a 10K. So I think it's also really important to get that message out there that just going for a gentle walk in the park can be really, really good for your mental well-being. And actually there is emerging evidence coming out that just being around nature and what we call green spaces or blue spaces. So being around, um, being around plants and trees or being next to water, these things help. I'm not quite sure what the mechanism is, and there's plenty of people looking into that right now, but we know that just spending a bit of time outdoors will give you a bit of a mental health benefit. So it's definitely a good idea. We've also had lots of suggestions that if you're getting stuck in these sort of upsetting thoughts <clears throat> and finding yourself kind of looping round and round, I'm sure probably everybody in here has had that experience of lying in bed, staring at the ceiling and your brain just not shutting down. If you find yourself in that situation, there are a few little tricks that people have suggested over the years. So I know somebody who counts back in threes from 200. I know somebody who thinks of a girl's name for every letter of the alphabet. And if they run out of, um, if they get to the end of the alphabet, they start again with boys' names. There's people who try to list all the states in the US. Whatever it might be, try to get yourself something like that that you can do that gives your brain something to chew on. I always think of this as like the um, equivalent of chewing gum for your brain, I suppose. Give it something to focus on so it can maybe pull a little bit back from that thought that you're stuck on. 
I've had people often suggest setting aside a little bit of time for yourself just to do something that's important for you. Um, I guess I always offer that with the caveat that it's not always easy, especially if you're in a role where you're you're very, very busy. You might be providing care or support to people within your family. Finding time for yourself can be really, really tricky. That said, if you are able to do that, even just five minutes for a cup of tea to yourself or go and have a nice hot bath if you can get a little bit of time. I know somebody who make sure that they make time to go for a massage once a week and they just find that incredibly valuable so it's about finding the things that work for you and just trying to make a little bit of space for yourself if you can i'm the kind of therapist that i am um, so i'm going to pra uh, recommend practicing mindful exercise to help you connect to the moment so we know that as, as people we're very good at kind of projecting forward into the future and worrying about what's coming ahead we're very good at um going back into the past and regretting things or being angry or frustrated about things or wishing we'd done things differently. We know that people who spend a lot of time in the future or in the past in that way tend to not have as good mental well-being as people who are able to kind of connect to now and live more in the moment. So that's why a lot of the therapeutic work I do is about helping people to get in touch with now and get the most from now that they possibly can. So that can be a really valuable thing to do. And YouTube is just absolutely stuffed with relaxation exercises and other mindful exercises that you can do just to help you get in touch by focusing on your breathing or your physical body or a visualization, whatever it might be. And I always recommend, and I'll come back to this idea of doing things that are important to you later on in this talk, but try to find something that fits with what you really value and what feels meaningful in life to you. So it might be helping somebody out, feeding the birds, doing a small job around the house. I'll go back to my mum. She has a really useful way of dealing with stress. She will go and clean something. So her house always looks fantastic. Sadly, I have not inherited that trait from her. But if you can find the thing that helps you, that makes you feel good about something that you've done, it can give you just a tiny lift. And it's all about those little wins if we can find them. I always bring this one and it can feel a little bit almost almost unnatural to think about because it can feel so, so tough to do, especially if you haven't done it before. But this is one that I use myself. A lot of the stuff that I recommend is because it works for me. So I can honestly say from the heart that I know that it works, even in times when it feels like it might not. There's been a lot of work in recent years um, from a, a tradition called positive psychology around gratitude and the, the importance of gratitude in helping you to feel happy and well and appreciate the good things in life. And there have been studies done around thinking about three positive things that have happened today that you're grateful for, about keeping a gratitude diary, about writing down your three things, whatever it might be. And the aim of all these things is to get you to focus on the stuff that has happened that is good. Even when it feels like pretty much everything is really tough and really awful, it really gets you hunting for those good things to notice. And that can feel so, so hard when life is difficult. It might not feel like there is very much to be grateful for. But the research does show that even if you can just focus on very tiny things like this, five minutes for a cup of tea, like a nice hot shower, like a kind word from somebody or, some, or enjoying the sunshine or whatever it might be, this tends to give your mental health a little bit of a boost. So I genuinely do this every single day, even on the days where things feel absolutely dreadful and I'm certain that I can't find three things. They're always in there somewhere. So I recommend giving this one a try. If you want to take away from today, that might be a nice one to have a go at. And I have one more suggestion um, for little things you can change for yourself. This one comes from social media. It does the rounds every so often. So some of you may well have seen this before. It says, treat yourself the way you would treat a small child. Feed yourself healthy foods, let yourself take naps, make time to play outside, put yourself to bed early, speak kindly to yourself. And the point of this is, I think if any of us were put in charge of a small child for the day and asked to keep the small child happy and well, we'd probably kind of know the basics that needed to be done. And they would involve um, feeding it healthy food, letting, making sure it got enough sleep and went to bed at a sensible time, got some fresh air, um, spoke kindly to it, and, tried to make generally make sure that it was um, well looked after and healthy. But we're not always very good at doing that for ourselves, especially if we're used to looking out for other people. We can get very good at putting other people first and not necessarily focusing too much on, on our own well-being, even in these really simple but really important ways. So on the other hand, we do know how difficult this is. So it's not as easy to just say, um, make sure you get enough sleep because sometimes you've got too much to do to get enough sleep. Sometimes you're not sleeping well. Sometimes there are things that you need to worry about or to do that can really interfere with that. But what I do know is if you're feeling low, if you're not feeling generally very um, mentally well, doing a quick sort of tick list against this can be really, really helpful. Have you had enough sleep lately? Have you had plenty of water and fluids? Have you had some healthy food? Have you had any time outside? Have you had any time to take care of yourself? How are we speaking to ourselves? These things are, they're small things, but big things, and they really do make a difference. So this is one that I like to show to people and, and let you take what you 
what you like from it. I'm just gonna show you this sort of scary looking academic graph for a very brief moment. This is uh, called a hierarchy of needs, which is often used in sort of psychological research. Um, what it does, I think, and how I use it therapeutically is to get people thinking about the things that are missing. So when I'm talking about these things that you, um, you need to feel well, to feel happy, a lot of them are on here, are things that people will quickly notice they don't have in their life. And the idea of this pyramid is that you need everything at the, uh, the lowest level in order to build up to the next level. So at a very basic level as humans, we need air, water, food, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. And if we don't have those things, then it's very difficult for us to, um, to be able to take off the things the next level up and the next and the next and the next. And I think what I often find is that people will come to therapy and they will find that maybe they've got that bottom layer maybe they've got some from the second i think around that layer of love and belonging is where people start to think actually maybe i don't have those things right now because i'm finding life really tough and i found that my my relationships are suffering a little bit i don't have that sense of connection i don't have that intimacy and then those things above it are just really hard to build up so that really important stuff for feeling well and happy that self-esteem that strength that freedom that sort of trying to become the best person that you can be that stuff can be really hard when those bottom layers have got holes in so it might be that looking at this, you're sort of thinking about some of the things that that maybe are a little bit missing for you at the moment. And that will feed into the next thing that we're talking about. One thing that is really important is knowing how to ask for help. And this sounds like such a silly thing, but it is so, so hard for a lot of people, including me. I'm not very good at asking for help either. Neither is my mum, neither was my dad. Um, we're not always good at asking for help. And when we do, we're not always totally clear about what we need, either because we don't know or because we're not very good at asking directly for what we want. Help is not just help. It's not that simple. So we might want emotional support from somebody. So someone to listen to us and to not judge us and just sit and be kind to us. On the other hand, we might want help with money or jobs around the house or resources. So practical support, which is very different to somebody just sitting and listening to you. We might also want advice and guidance, so helping you to, to cope, to find your way through um, with all of the complexities that might come with um, living with Huntington's. And it might be something about social support from people who understand what you're going through, so you feel less alone. There's lots of different ways that we might need help. And there's a reason this is important. There's a really nice example from a book called Facing the Storm by Ray Owen, which I read recently and I'm getting absolutely nothing from plugging it. I just thought it was brilliant, really accessible, really interesting. And it's about coping with grief. One of the examples that he gave in it was of a, I think it was an invented person, so it's just a, a story example, but somebody who had recently lost their wife, they had children to look after, and they were trying to get ready for work in the morning, trying to get themselves ready, trying to get the kids' lunches ready and get the kids into their uniform and everything, and they were just running around like a headless chicken, and at that point their next door neighbour wandered in and said, I know that you're having a really tough time since you lost your wife, would you like to sit down and have a cup of tea and talk about it? And his reaction was, actually, I'd really just prefer you did the ironing for me because that's what I need right now. So the person had the best possible intentions, but they weren't offering the right kind of help. And maybe that's familiar to some people in this room today. Most people who are genuinely offering are probably going to be happy to give you what you need, not what they want to give you. But we have to be able to ask. And that means knowing what it is that we need and having a really clear idea of what we're asking for. And sometimes starting to have those conversations with people about what it is that you might need and how they can help you can be really, really helpful to sort of have these in advance rather than waiting until you reach breaking point. And again, I bet this is familiar to a lot of people in here, this idea of just keeping going and trying to keep on trudging along and then things just manage to get on top of you. And at that point you need help because you've hit crisis points. So asking before is really, really important. Now I am gonna talk about the boiling frog, but um, I have said to many people, some of whom are here today, that I absolutely hate this metaphor. It's gross, it's horrible, it's not kind to the animal and I'm a vegetarian on top of that but I don't have a better one. So if you have a better one, please stick it in the chat because I've been looking for a replacement for years. For those who don't know the boiling frog, the idea of this is that apparently, and I don't know if this is true, and hopefully nobody knows if this is true, but if you try to put a frog into a pan of boiling water, the frog will quickly just hop out and, um, and leg it because it knows the boiling water will hurt it. If you put a frog in a pan of cold water and slowly heat it up to boiling point, sorry, um, the frog will just sit there and not jump out because the very gradual change doesn't kind of trigger that, oh my God, I need to get out of here impulse. Now, the reason this is relevant here is because people in um, in situations where they're affected by Huntington's often just keep on going and that water gets hotter and things get more difficult. 
And maybe you don't quite realize until eventually you reach a point where things feel really, really tough. And actually, if you've just been stri- uh, dropped straight into that situation, you would think, well, this is completely unacceptable and bad for me. I'm off. But because you get there bit by bit, you don't always realize. So it's really important to get some support in place, to ask for support from people before you think you need it and to try and kind of honestly take stock of the situation that you're in and how things are looking, because we might find we've just sat there and let the water get a bit too hot. Hopefully that's making sense to some people in here. In terms of places to find support, these are just a few ideas, some of which you'll be more than aware of already, but there are um, options to ask for help from family. Of course, it depends on your family, your relationships with them, their level of involvement. There might be emotional and practical support that you can get from friends. There's obviously a third sector, obviously, obviously the HDA and the um, specialist advisors. There's, um, there's social services, there's the NHS. Just having that plan for where to get help when it's not a crisis means you have the info to hand when you need it. Now, as I'm coming towards the, the end of today, I want to talk a little bit about the therapeutic approaches that we have towards supporting people affected with HD. And the general thrust of, of therapy, I guess, is that when we can't change difficult situations, we still have the power to change our responses and thereby improve our well-being. There are some forms of therapy and some kind of medical approaches that can be focused very heavily on how you're responding alone. So how you're behaving and how you're thinking. And as a result, they focus on changing your behavior and fixing um, what's sometimes referred to as maladaptive or unhelpful thought patterns. All of which can be really helpful in the right context. There is loads and loads of evidence that that approach can sort loads of things out and make life much better. But it really depends on the situation that it's dealing with and the context that you're sitting within. So this assumption that changing your behavior and your thinking will fix things sometimes works but it doesn't consider your circumstances, your relationships to people around you, what people around you are doing, the things that you're having to cope with. And with Huntington's, a lot of problems aren't solvable by changing your thoughts or your behavior. They might not be fixable at all because Huntington's isn't gonna go away because we act differently or think differently. It's still gonna be there, it's still tough. All of which is why I am very, very fond of acceptance and commitment therapy and it's the way that I choose to practice. I'm gonna call it ACT for the rest of today because that's a big mouthful. I feel this is a better fit for people affected by Huntington's because it involves acknowledging and accepting the difficult things in life that can't be changed and the way that we're reacting to them. So it's not saying that we can change how we respond to things and that will make everything better. It's saying things will still be tough, but they can be better alongside those difficult things. It also focuses a lot on identifying what really matters to you. We call that your values. So the things that matter most and get you out of bed in the morning and getting you to commit to taking an action that aligns with those values. So focusing more on what matters to you in your life. And along that, it teaches a bunch of skills around um, identifying thoughts that are unhelpful and starting to engage with them differently. So living alongside them rather than fighting to change them and thereby to improve your well-being generally. We talk a lot about values. I've just mentioned those, but this means your, your most important principles to you, your underlying guide to life. And they're like Points on a compass, I guess, is how we tend to talk about them. They guide you towards the things that really matter, the things that make life feel richer and more meaningful. They're about what we want to stand for, who we want to be. So these things that are really founding principles in terms of who we think we are. And I guess a lot of those we can figure out by the stories that we tell about ourselves. I think we all have these kind of beliefs about who we are. You might think of yourself as someone who helps people who need it, um, somebody who likes to teach people or inform people. You might think of yourself as someone who's bad at drawing. It's not always a a good story. Sometimes it's about things that we're not good at. Or you might think of yourself as someone who's quite like fit and sporty. And these things can be really important clues about things that we think are important or that we value. So it might be being caring. It might be teaching other people. It might be being creative or being fit and healthy. And there might be other things that really matter to us that we know about, like being a good mum, being honest, working hard. And these things aren't always obvious. Sometimes the people who know us, like our friends and our loved ones, they can be actually better at picking these things out than we are about ourselves. But we've all got these things, which are the most important things that, that we'd like to direct our action and make us what we would consider to be a good person. There's one quite nice way to figure them out. So I'd like you to imagine that you won a prize in a contest and every morning your bank is going to deposit £86,400 into your bank account. And that money is yours to use, but it does come with a couple of rules. At the end of the day, the bank is going to take back anything that you haven't spent and you're not allowed to transfer it or stuff it under your mattress or anything clever. They're just going to take away what's left. But then you get a fresh 86,400 every morning. The second rule is the bank can finish that system and stop it anytime they want without warning. They close your account and it's all over. So what we'd ask people to do if somebody came to therapy is ask, what would you do with that money? 
and if this was a workshop, like we'd originally hoped I would be talking to you about this right now, but since I can't, you might have thought about things like buying anything that you wanted, buying things for people you love, donating to charity, giving money to um, strangers who really need the money, starting a business. Basically, you try to use it all as well as you could according to what you really value and thinking about what matters the most to you. So this can be a really big flag towards the things that really, really matter to you in life. And act is very sort of metaphor heavy. So this is also, um, that number is for a reason. We each wake up with 86,400 seconds to spend every day. And we can't keep any of it. All we can do is spend it as well as we can every day. So again, in therapy, we'd start thinking about with all the demands on our time, there are things that we have to do, things that we really want to do and things that would be nice to do. So how do we start allocating that in order to do the things that are really important to us and make sure we cover the things that are really important? And having thought about that, you would work with your therapist to start making a plan for how you focus more on the things that matter most to you. Make a plan to start taking small steps to make things better. I'm going to finish in the last couple of minutes by talking about what um, the HDA and I are doing to try to... Um, to address some of this stuff and to offer some of this to people affected by Huntington's. We recently started running um, a program called Keeping Yourself in Mind, which you might have seen mentioned in, um, in emails and various things. It's an ACT intervention, which is based on um, my clinical experience on research findings, um, my own and other people's, and talking to people who are affected by Huntington's. And because we've now run the course um, a couple of times, we're now getting this kind of feedback from people who've been through it and tell us what works and what didn't work so well for them. So it's something that we're constantly trying to improve on. Um, as I said, it's run um, in partnership with the HDA and the, um, the support is just so appreciated. I can't even tell you, to be honest, I couldn't do the stuff that, um, that I'm trying to do without all of the support of the HDA. Um, it's an online group intervention. It's eight weeks long, 90 minute sessions. And the first people who came were a group of six people who were in a, a carer or caregiver role supporting somebody with HD. During that group, we focused on helping people become more aware of their emotional well-being, think about the things they need to change, teaching skills for stepping back from difficult emotions and reducing stress, helping people figure out their values, which I've talked about already, and then supporting people to make those plans for aligning their life more with what really, really matters to them. So far, it's looking really, really good. So we saw that um, the people who've been through it already had um, improvements in low mood, improvements in anxiety. They felt that their quality of life was better, which is just wonderful. And there was an improvement in this thing we call psychological flexibility, which is about sort of being bound up with those difficult thoughts and feelings and finding it really hard to like disengage. And we also had some really positive comments about the experience of the group and the impact that it had. So overall, very early data. And we are, of course, going to do the academic thing and look to publish it, et cetera, et cetera. But we're just really, really happy that it made that positive impact for people first time around. And on the second last slide now, um, the next steps that we're kind of taking, um, we're going to keep on running this program for our caregivers. We've got another group running at the moment. We've also expanded it to people who are gene positive for HD, which is again running right now. And we've got a little bit of funding to support us continuing to develop this course. And then, as I said, we're doing the, uh, the academic thing, but we're not just doing that because we want to publish papers. We're doing that because it gets us the evidence that we need to show that this works. And then we can give out the materials and everything you need to run these programs to other organizations with the confidence that they're going to be helpful for the people that they're hoping to help. So we're really excited about this. And it's something that I'm personally extremely proud of and so grateful for the HDA for, for working with me so that we can do this. Which is kind of a nice note to finish on, right? There are too many people on here to say thank you to. So I guess the bits to pick out are thank you to the HDA. Um, my brilliant students, my brilliant research assistant, my wonderful collaborators, and a special thanks to members of HD Voice who have been very kind in getting involved and in giving us feedback for the stuff that we're working on. And all of that brings me to a close. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks for inviting me and thanks everyone for listening.